Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to part two of our special podcast for World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day 2020. In part one, we interviewed Angela Peacock and we talked about her experiences of taking and coming off benzodiazepines and also her involvement in the film Medicating Normal, which has a special screening and panel discussion on July the 11th at 1pm EST. And you can hear that interview by visiting maddenamerica.com. And before we go on, I just wanted to say that these podcasts would not be possible without the efforts of WBAD lead operations volunteer Nicole Lamberson, who goes above and beyond to make these interviews possible. So later in this episode, we will hear from Baylissa Frederick, who is a therapeutic coach and psychotherapist with over two decades experience working with clients affected by prescribed drug injury. But before we chat with Belissa, I'm delighted to get the chance to talk with clinical pharmacologist Dr. Jim Wright. Jim is Emeritus Professor in the Departments of Anesthesiology, Pharmacology and Therapeutics and Medicine at the University of British Columbia. Jim obtained his MD from the University of Alberta in 1968 and his PhD in Pharmacology from McGill University in 1976. He is a practicing specialist in internal medicine and clinical pharmacology. He is also editor-in-chief of the Therapeutics Letter, and he sits on the editorial boards of PLOS One and the Cochrane Library. Dr. Wright's research focuses on issues relating to the appropriate use of prescription drugs, clinical pharmacology, clinical trials, systematic review, meta-analysis, and knowledge translation. Dr. Wright, Jim, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today for the Madden America podcast. And um, to get us started, really, I'd like to perhaps ask a little bit about you and, and your background and what it was that led you to a career as a, a clinical pharmacologist. I got interested in, uh, in drugs in medical school, and I came to realize that uh, a lot of the problems that patients had, you could solve by uh, uh, looking at the drugs they're on and, and what uh, might be causing some of the problems. Uh, and so often uh, I, I found that I could solve people's problems by stopping their drugs, not by starting new drugs. And when I um, went to uh, Montreal and was doing uh, my internship in internal medicine, I um, decided to... Uh, get involved in a, in a PhD in pharmacology at, uh, at McGill. And so I was able to expand my uh, understanding of pharmacology and, and, and keep my clinical skills uh, going at the same time. They, and there was a strong clinical pharmacology program at, at McGill at the time. So basically, I've been uh, interested in, in doing clinical pharmacology for the whole of my career. Anyway, I think most you know, people don't appreciate that most doctors don't have a very strong uh, understanding of pharmacology. And, and even pharmacists don't. I mean, pharmacists are very good at classifying drugs and knowing all the drugs, but they don't really understand uh, the, the uh, complexities of, of the effects of drugs in, in people. And um, it's a very complex field. So the more you, anyway, the more you know about a drug, the less likely you would be willing to, to, to take it. To, and particularly not on a, on a daily basis, and that and that's really where people get into trouble. It's really uh, just accepting and trusting and and taking things. And it's amazing how people would research uh, when they uh, buy a TV or a, a car and uh, look into it in depth, but they'll be willing to start taking a drug without uh, lear- learning much about it at all. So, really, I think that's the big problem in medicine today. Is uh, the, the drugs that people are taking on a daily basis that are having a, a permanent or, or at least a serious effects on their brain. You used that phrase in, a, in some communication we had when, when setting up this meeting, and I was intrigued by that, you know, because I haven't heard many pharmacologists be willing to say publicly that the more they know about a drug, the less they'd be perhaps willing to take it themselves. And I wondered if that was based upon your knowledge of the effects of the drug's 
on the body itself or whether it's from knowledge of people's different experiences with some type of types of drugs or, or, or you know whether it's a combination of both really that's kind of led you to that uh, you know to be able to say that so clearly it's really a combination of um so there's no drug that um that has a significant effect in a in a person that doesn't have potential harms and so we always need to be uh, weighing the the potential benefits for, versus the potential harms. And when you when you start to appreciate the potential harms, um, they're they're significant and often serious. But you you can find that out by just reading the drug monograph, right? And and looking at the adverse effects. If people did that, I mean, I think there would be less people willing to uh, just take drugs. Yeah, you can uh, you can uh, cause a lot of damage by. Uh, by taking the drug on a, on a daily basis, particularly. I've experienced myself, you know, doctors, prescribers saying to me, you know, don't worry too much about all the listed side effects because they're very rare and only a very small number of people get them. But, you know, re- reading that list of adverse effects is quite important for informed consent, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. You know, and they, and they often are rare, but uh, yeah, they can be, uh, uh, be life-threatening and uh, yeah, so mm. it's, uh, it's not something you want to do lightly. Thank you. And um, you're a member of um, the Therapeutics Initiative. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that organization and, and uh, what, what it does and maybe how you got involved. Yeah. So the, the latter part of my career, I was convinced to, to become the managing director of the Therapeutics Initiative was in 1994. And that led me into um, a field of research which is called uh, systematic review and uh, and looking at the benefits and harms of, of drugs. Uh, and so I've been doing that and was either managing or co-managing director for 25 years. And in addition to that role, I was the editor-in-chief of the Therapeutics Letter, which is uh, published by the Therapeutics Initiative and is, is freely available on the website. And those uh, letters come out... Um, every couple of months and they're usually kept quite short and they're primarily for prescribing doctors but uh, there's a lot of good information for anybody who wants to to read them and there um, we we in the therapeutics initiative have a, a rule that you can't have any conflicts of interest it's been that way since the very beginning so it's people who are looking at the the research are it's they're they're completely independent and not not conflicted and nothing to gain from from the drugs or from from any of the recommendations that are made so in in October of last year after 25 years I decided it was time for me to step down and so I'm no longer the the co-managing director I'm still uh, involved uh, with the group uh, and still on the on the steering uh, uh, group but uh, but I'm not uh, the co-managing director anymore and that's uh, that's given me a bit of a, a break and i'm also not the editor-in-chief of the letter which is also was was quite a big quite a big job so tom perry now is the editor-in-chief of the of the letter and in january of this year i retired from the university and so i'm now professor emeritus but i i've stayed on as the uh, coordinating editor or sort of editor in chief of the cochrane hypertension group so i'm still doing systematic review uh, research i still see some patients on uh, one day a week in the clinic i wanted to ask a little bit about the therapeutics letter which i found really really interesting because um you know obviously as a consumer or as a patient when you when you do read the official information on on drugs, perhaps the package insert or, or information that your doctor has given you, you're never really sure of the provenance of it. And it very rarely includes any information at all from people that have taken that drug for whatever condition it tends to be from the manufacturer's view of things. And the therapeutics letter I found interesting because not only does it present manufacturer-like information about drugs, but it also includes anecdotal accounts you know, that's that's something quite interesting that I've not seen before, because certainly in the UK and I guess in in the US and Canada too, you know, doctors sometimes tend to frown on anecdotal accounts of uh, using drugs in this way. But to me, I, I think they're a fairly fundamental and important part of a rounded understanding of what the effect of a particular drug or intervention might have. So I, I was really interested to see that you use anecdotal information in your therapeutics work. Yeah, not not um, to a large degree, but um, when we were talking about withdrawal from uh, 
antidepressants. Uh, there isn't much evidence, right? There isn't, there aren't clinical trials uh, in that area, or not very much, right? So in that area, the the best evidence is actually anecdotal evidence. And when we get into adverse effects, also you often can't find uh, very much uh, good information in terms of uh, in terms of the randomized trials. And so then you have to go beyond that and look at uh, at sort of uh, observational studies and experience. But in in general, you know what we've learned from in the therapeutics initiative over the twenty five years that uh, I was there is that when you look into the the evidence that is used by regulators to put drugs on the market and you and you get into that in detail uh, we we were and we continue to be uh, quite shocked by how how weak the evidence is that uh, for that the benefits outweigh the harms and often it's a small statistically significant difference between the drug and placebo but uh, not clinically very important and uh, I'm often surprised that it's on the market and we're giving it to people uh, with that weak evidence so that's the biggest thing that we learned. And then also we learned that the harms associated with uh, drugs are often much more than, than we used to think. Because when we go into something, we have a sort of idea about it at the beginning. And by the end of it, we appreciate that, uh, that the harms are, are much greater than uh, most people think. And I wondered why you thought it was that perhaps we don't have this rigorous scientific understanding of adverse effects and you know the the uh, you know propensity for the drugs to act, affect people in, in a negative way you know is is that because of the way that clinical trials are done on these drugs or is it because we're not really capturing adverse effect data in quite the way we should you know i wonder why we don't know more about the safety of these drugs now have after after many of them have been prescribed for some time decades in some cases that's mostly because there are very few long term trials so almost all the drugs get on the market with uh, um, fairly short-term trials. So really, there's really only evidence for over short-term. But, you know, what happens in, in practice is then people uh, start to use them uh, long-term and daily, and, uh, and there, there really isn't any evidence on, in terms of the benefits and harms and for long-term. And there's no um, incentive by drug companies to do uh, long-term trials. And so we really need uh, governments to be pushing for that and, and uh, funding uh, long-term trials so we can actually know what the benefits and harms are. Yeah, and I guess long-term trials are technically difficult and probably very costly because it's, it's technically difficult to follow somebody for decades of treatment, isn't it? Yeah, but I, I've also argued that, you know, they're not that expensive if you do it because we do track... In administrative databases, you know, we track hospitalizations and deaths. And so, so you can do actually large uh, long-term trials without having a huge uh, budget. And it doesn't cost very much to randomize people. So that's, that's the key thing is actually to set it up so that you actually randomize people and, uh, and to come to, uh, uh, in order to be able to come to some answers. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, so since this interview is, is being shared on World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day. We'll focus in on benzodiazepines now a little bit, if, if that's okay. And I know you have an interest in, in benzodiazepines, so I wondered what it was that kind of piqued your interest in that class of drugs. Well, we, um, we did a letter on benzodiazepines uh, fairly early on. It's probably back in 96. At that time, we had got uh, an idea of how many people were taking them, them in, in British Columbia. And it was quite surprising at how many people were taking them uh, on on a long term basis. And then, and you, as you start, as you get into it, you you realize you appreciate that uh, that the evidence uh, for, for the the drugs is fairly weak, and that um, most people were taking it for for sleep, probably uh, for for insomnia, uh, but the trials uh, that were done in in those people were fairly short. And it seemed to help maybe a, a little bit uh, uh, in the short term, but um, by the even by uh, uh, a week or two weeks, they're probably not sleeping any better than the than the placebo group. And but they got on the market uh, based on that, and and the monographs um, as a result of that say that uh, you know it's only they sh- should only be used short term. So the problem with benzodiazepines is that isn't happening. 
And once you start to take it long term, then you become tolerant. Uh, the drug is really not helping anymore. And uh, over long term, you uh, it appears that uh, we're we're learning more and more about uh, the toxicity associated with long term use. So. So, yeah. so what what would you consider then a, a appropriate use of benzodiazepines? If uh, you know, I, I know there's been some guidance that they should only be prescribed short term, but I, I wondered in what situations you felt it was appropriate, and then perhaps not appropriate to prescribe benzodiazepines. The only way I prescribe them now is as as rescue therapy, and I think that's the best term. And so I explain to the patients that. Uh, if you take them regularly, they won't work. And uh, that, uh, but if you do take them as rescue therapy, they they continue to be effective and uh, and then and can be useful for some people. So if a person is taking uh, um, one for sleep, uh, say three or four times a month, they they can find it uh, useful. And uh, and then they you know and they, and they would they need to know you know when 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 that would be appropriate. And so some people are able to use it in that way and uh, don't get into any any trouble with it. You mentioned a little bit earlier that you'd kind of identified withdrawal issues from antidepressants and benzodiazepines as a, a perhaps a particular area of concern and, and one where there isn't much scientific rigor. And I, I believe that you, you've kind of written about or perhaps discussed using methods of liquid titration to withdraw from benzodiazepines, particularly very slowly. So I, I wondered if it was possible for you to perhaps explain a little bit about using that method to, to come off them. And, you know, has, has it been more successful or less successful than, than other methods of stopping benzodiazepines, in your opinion? Well, I should just mention that uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, I have... Um, uh, partly through uh, meeting uh, Heather Ashton and uh, and and learning about uh, some of the problems and the class action suit in in the UK against uh, benzodiazepine uh, companies, uh, I've gotten more and more interested in in helping people uh, come off of uh, of benzodiazepines. And so, I've always used the Heather Ashton manual and the, and that principle. And so I I've I've been referred, um, you know, a growing number of patients um, with this problem and helped them to come off. And so um, what I've learned is that it's extremely difficult. Every patient that I've ever helped uh, uh, come off of benzodiazepines has described it as the worst thing that they, has ever happened to them in their life. And so that's something for people to, to think about. The principle is to do it slowly, 10% every uh, two weeks, say, and um, and the other one of the other principles that Heather Ashton uh, promotes is that you should tailor it uh, to the patient. And so when I when I'm helping people, uh, we we work out what works best for them. And so some people need to do it extremely slowly. And so it's actually patients who have uh, introduced me to the, the liquid titration method, and they're the ones who have found it on the internet and and have worked it out. And but print, the principle is that you. Um, you put a standard amount into a, to a standard amount of liquid, and uh, you you create a suspension. Uh, they don't dissolve; there, it's a suspension knot. And then you um, can uh, then uh, pour off uh, a certain amount um, and and, a, and an increasing amount. And so you can can lower it at whatever rate you you want uh, over a period of time. So, but they have to be careful uh, in their uh, uh, and they have to be willing to to do it very carefully in order to for it to work. But some people that works, and some people it doesn't. So it's uh, not something for everybody. And I wondered if if you'd noticed the difference between people who may have tried to stop more abruptly and people that have used a, a gradual withdrawal me withdrawal method. You know, particularly perhaps in terms of protracted or long term symptoms, or or you know their need to kind of go back on to the drug to stabilize you know is 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 titration better a better option for people um titration is definitely better in terms of the success rate um if you do it slowly they're much more likely to to be successful the people who who do it um, more quickly or abruptly uh, very likely end up um, back on uh, on the drug and so they really haven't uh, accomplished anything but if somebody is off and they're doing all right, obviously you want to support that, and even you know, independent of whether they did it uh, slowly or or not. And there, and we don't really have good evidence that 
any particular rate of decrease leads to less uh, protracted uh, uh, symptoms after you get off. That's uh, something that we uh, somebody needs to to really uh, be researching. Yeah, we need to study this uh, whole phenomenon of uh, of long term uh, adverse consequences of coming off these drugs. And, and I wondered then, um, again, I'm sure the US and Canada are quite similar to here in the UK. You know, prescribers here, particularly, I have to say, general practitioners, the family doctors really do not seem to know very much at all about the need to gradually withdraw people from dependence forming drugs, particularly benzodiazepines, but also antidepressants too. So, you know, this is, you know, many people I've spoken with have had such poor advice to stop so quickly and then they go back to their doctor in distress and the doctor says it's relapse. You know, it's it's your, you know, your pre-diagnosed condition. You know, the, the, the drugs being at fault is the last thing they think of. So, you know, you know, how can we best approach the medical establishment to say, look, you know, certain classes of psychoactive drugs need to be tapered gradually and probably for the majority of people that take them for, uh, you know, certainly a, above, say, a few months or, or, you know, whatever it might be. Because I think the default at the moment is cut the drug by half or a quarter over a few weeks. And, you know, that's that causes some people dreadful problems, I think. No, I agree. The benzodiazepine is, is kind of now being more accepted. College of Physicians in British Columbia actually provide the uh, Heather Ashton uh, manual on, on their website. There are, is a growing understanding uh, of the problem uh, of, with benzodiazepines. Um, hopefully, I don't know, uh, we, we, we could probably, um, when I say we, the Therapeutics Initiative could look at prescribing over time and we could see if there is some, some decrease in prescribing, but uh, it probably isn't widespread, but at least there, I think there is some more appreciation that uh, these are not good drugs to be taken long term. Are there practical difficulties for people in titrating off benzodiazepines? You know, I, I, I know on the antidepressant side of things that liquid versions are available for some classes of antidepressant, but not all. You know, for benzodiazepines, is, is, is that similar? Is the liquid available for the more common variants and not for the others? Or is it easier to get hold of for benzodiazepines? I'm not familiar with how convenient liquid formulations, no. So if you're going to do the liquid titration, you have to uh, do it yourself. There are compounding pharmacists that will um, prepare drugs in precise amounts uh, in, in capsules. And so sometimes uh, people, uh, we do it uh, through a compounding pharmacist. Uh, the principle for benzodiazepines is to transfer to diazepam if, if it's possible. Uh, because it's longer acting, and uh, and there are smaller uh, tablets, and so you you know so it's more convenient in terms of uh, uh, gradually reducing the dose. But the main thing uh, you know I guess is for the person to become knowledgeable and uh, find out what works best for them. There are some people who are very good at measuring it uh, on a on a jeweler scale uh, and measuring uh, small amounts and, uh, and, and doing it that way. So there, so there are a number of way, different ways that it can be done. Yeah. Yeah. When I first became aware of this world, I was quite staggered to find out actually how much people had to self-support and do this for themselves because their prescribers were not aware really of, of the need to taper gradually. They weren't aware of any methods to do it. You know, they, they in some cases, unfortunately, weren't particularly supportive of the person trying to do it. So people end up, you know, without doctors like you, Jim, you know, to who do know about this and who are willing to advise and to reference the Ashton Manual and encourage people to, to you know, make use of that. I think it's, um, it's, it's quite an indictment, actually, that prescribers are so in the dark about this. And they do, um, and they need, they need support. So, yeah, so they need some uh, people uh, there to, to help them along the way and uh, and the people who are successful also are more successful if they have a family support a spouse or uh, somebody who is uh, is also helping them but it's uh, extremely uh, uh, difficult thing uh, that i guess that's one of the main messages is that how difficult it is and so they so you need people who actually can appreciate that and and uh, can appreciate that the symptoms that they're having are real and uh, 
Yeah, but you're right. There are a lot of a lot of physicians still aren't knowledgeable about that. Thank you, Jim. And in an article in the Chronicle Journal, you talk about how the brain has changed as a result of the drug in patients who have taken benzodiazepines regularly. And you also talk about withdrawal effects, meaning that your brain is trying to heal and readapt. So can these issues of physical dependence, tolerance and withdrawal be thought of as brain or central nervous system injury, especially in patients who go on to be protracted sufferers? Yeah, I'm, I'm convinced that that's the case. We, we don't have any measure of it. And maybe someday there, there will be a measure of it. And then it would be a help um, to be able to see why some people are having more trouble than others. But um, I'm convinced that uh, all these drugs, that the, when, you, when you take it on a, on a regular basis, right? So not if you take it intermittently, but if you take it on a regular basis, the brain does adapt to try and counteract the effect and so that it is standard that uh, tolerance uh, does occur to all drugs that have an effect on the brain it, it, it's uh, it includes alcohol and uh, any any drug that uh, is taken on a chronic basis and uh, leads to tolerance and that tolerance is a change in the brain and so when that drug is not there anymore, then the brain, that change is still there, and so it leads to, uh, to symptoms. So I'm, I'm convinced that that's the case and that it's a big problem for all uh, psychoactive drugs. We, we know that it occurs, and we also know that it probably can be relatively permanent. Um, because we know that with antipsychotic drugs, people uh, quite frequently uh, develop tardive dyskinesia. And that's a uh, neurological uh, phenomenon where they have involuntary movements of their tongue or other parts of their body. And, um, and we know that can be relatively permanent. So anybody who says that drugs can't cause uh, uh, permanent uh, effects on the brain is, are... are are discounting that that uh, that observation that is is well known has been known for um, uh, I think twenty years or so. So likely these other things that people experience are almost certainly uh, due to uh, changes in the brain as well. And is there any merit in pharmacological intervention for someone struggling with post drawal effects, or does that just risk creating further complications? No, I'm, I'm frequently asked that. And um, when I'm helping people to uh, come off, uh, they frequently say, well, can I take something that will make this easier? And, uh, and my answer is always uh, no, and, and, uh, and definitely don't take anything that's uh, acting on the brain, because that just is going to complicate things uh, more. And there's no supplements or anything. Um, so maybe someday we'll, there will be something that might help, but for the most part, anything is going to just complicate things. So you want to use exercise and getting the brain uh, involved in uh, m mental activities to to distract and uh, and healthy diet and uh, good sleep patterns um, and uh, you have to do all of those things. And then psychotherapy, I think, is uh, is helpful, but you have to be with a psychotherapist who's not uh, going to uh, prescribe drugs. So. That's frequently hard to hard to find. Most uh, most psychiatrists aren't willing to just provide therapy. So, there is a Vancouver benzodiazepine support group that lists you on their website as the only qualified doctor available in the Vancouver area who understands the implications of taking benzodiazepines and who understands and supports a benzo withdrawal program. So why do you think it is that so many benzodiazepine-affected patients have such a hard time finding knowledgeable providers such as yourself, especially after the problems with this particular class of drugs have been in the literature in some form since perhaps the 1960s? I'm frequently asked if I can find some, somebody. And I, there are very few clinical pharmacologists in the world is one, is, a, is one of the issues. And, I don't, and most clinical pharmacologists aren't uh, in, interested in this particular area. I don't think there's a lot of money to be made in, uh, in helping people uh, get off of drugs. So that's, that's one uh, that, is, that is an issue. I've certainly exposed a lot of students to the problem and to patients, and so um, I'm hoping that some of those will uh, continue on and with an interest uh, in this area. But uh, I guess that's the re the main reason. It's a difficult area to to help people, but uh, they certainly it certainly needed.
At the University of British Columbia faculty and staff page, one of your research interests is listed as educational strategies to improve drug prescribing behaviour. So, in your opinion, can prescribing behaviour be improved where benzodiazepines are concerned? Yeah, definitely. Um, that, that's the solution, right? So, if so all doctors now should be warning patients and, and only prescribing for uh, short-term use or for uh, rescue therapy. And they should just refuse to uh, prescribe uh, long-term. And there are more and more uh, doctors doing that. And in, in British Columbia, there's, um, the college is working to try and uh, encourage uh, doctors to, to not prescribe long-term. So, so there is uh, some movement in, in that regard. In a 2007 article about the Therapeutics Initiative, you said consumers should always ask physicians for evidence that drug treatments are effective and that nobody should take anything unless they've been adequately convinced that the benefits outweigh the harms. So it seems like this is a bit of an information minefield. So how can consumers go about trying to get hold of the information that will allow them to make the best choice for their long-term health and well-being? The sad thing is that um, if you ask most prescribers, you know, what is the evidence that, the, that this is a, a benefit? And even more important, if you ask them, what's the benefit uh, over the long term? They wouldn't know that there haven't been any long term trials for virtually any of these drugs, antidepressants, antipsychotics, uh, uh, benzodiazepines. Uh. So the answer is no, we don't know what, whether the benefits outweigh the harms. <laughs> And I'm growingly uh, convinced that for many of these drugs, uh, that the harms uh, significantly outweigh the benefits. Thank you, Jim. It's so heartening to get to talk with someone who acknowledges the risks and takes such a careful and cautious route to prescribing. And also someone willing to help and support those who have suffered iatrogenic harm, even though they followed their prescriber's instructions to the letter. I, I'd like to just mention that I think uh, Robert Whitaker is, is doing a, a great service uh, to society through his book and, uh, and his attempts to uh, enlighten people about the, the whole problem. You know, so we need to uh, encourage uh, people like him as well. But Anatomy of an Epidemic, I recommend to all my patients to read. And, uh, and I do think it is uh, really an important, uh, important epidemic that we need to be uh, aware of and that is almost certainly being due, caused by drugs, not helped by drugs, but actually caused by drugs. Thank you so much for your time, Jim. It's been great to get to talk about some of these issues for World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day. OK, thanks a lot. Yeah, take, take care. So I just want to thank Jim for taking the time to chat for the podcast. And you can find out more about his work by visiting the website of the Therapeutics Initiative, which is www.ti.ubc.ca. And thank you to you all for listening, to all of you for sharing your stories, and for everyone involved in making World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day the incredible event that it is. So until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.